Hi and welcome to the On Maths prediction for the Paper 3 Foundation Tier OCR Paper. Enjoy! Hi, I'm Chris Gilpin and welcome to this predicted paper. So we've looked at paper one and paper two, taken away all of those topics and put them to one side, and we're just focused on the topics we have left. With those topics, we've created the paper three prediction. Now, I'm gonna go through the entire prediction for one set of numbers, but if you go onto onmaths.com, I'm sure the link is appearing above me as we speak, then you can do the paper as many times as you want for absolutely for free, um, but it changes the numbers so that you're remembering methods and not answers. So it'd be a really great tool, uh, maybe do it once today and then another time tomorrow and just keep practicing it. Um, you can also sign up for free and it saves your scores and there's a whole load of other stuff on, on the website as well. Now, a caveat we always say with these papers is these are a revision tool. Uh, obviously, please do other revision as well, but these are a great way of just checking to see whereabouts you're at um, with your revision. So I hope this helps. Um, if you like this video, please click like. If you want to see more from us, please click subscribe. Enjoy. So for this question, you just kind of got to imagine what the shape will look like when it's finished. Um, and the thing that's stopping it from looking perfect is not having this square here and let's just check it has four lines of symmetry when I put that in so we've got one there we've got one across here then we have a diagonal one uh, here and then we've got another diagonal one here so it has four lines of symmetry for this question, we need to understand the difference between multiples and factors. Multiples are just a numbers times table. So the multiples of 5 will be 5, 10, 15, 20, etc, etc. Now every number in the 5 times table ends in 0 or 5. So looking at the list of numbers we've got here, there's only one that ends in a 5 or a 0, which is 10. So 10 is a multiple of 5. Now factors go the other way. A factor of a number means that the number, so 24, is in another numbers times table. So 24, and the easiest way to find the factors of 24 is you start off with 1 and 24. So 1 times 24 is 24. Then you go 2 times, well, 12. 3 times, three times 8. Uh, 4 times, and you think how many 4s? 6. 5 times, well, that doesn't work six times we've already got so those eight numbers are the factors of 24 then I look at the list well already there's a 24 there is there any other ones I could have written I don't see any other ones so 24 is my answer there two prime numbers now prime numbers mean they only have two factors one and themselves okay that's a prime number if there's any more factors it's not a prime number so let's go through the list. 10 is in the 5 times table, which we identified in question A, so that's not a prime number. 24, well, we've listed out six other factors of 24, so that's not in it. Uh, 18 is 3 times 6, so that's not going to be it. 17, I don't think of any times tables that 17 is in, so I'm going to say 17 is a prime number, which it is. And 19, well, I can't think of any times tables 19 is in. So I think that's a prime number. Let's go through the rest to make sure. So 16 is 2 and 8, so that's not a prime number. And any even number apart from 2 is not going to be a prime number. 2 is the only even prime number. 27 looks like it might be, but actually 3 times 9 is 27, so it's definitely not. And 28 is another even number. So it looks like we found the two prime numbers. On this um, scale on the side of the jug, we're not given the little tiny notches. So the word estimate means that we're not going to get it exactly right, maybe, but we're roughly going to be correct. Now, there are wrong answers to this. So if I wrote the answer 22, 
which would be down here somewhere. That's clearly wrong because we know that the water is above 30. We know the water is between 30 and 40. And if you have a look, it's less than halfway. So we're expecting a number that's below 35. I think if you wrote the number 35, you would get that wrong because it's clearly less than halfway. I think the numbers probably, to get it right, you might get away with 34, but definitely 33 or 32. I think, personally, it's closer to 33, but some of you might look at that and think it's closer to 32, and chances are we'll both get the marks. So for this question we're asked to find a, the percentage of the shape that's shaded. So there are four sections in total and two of them are shaded. So as a fraction that would be 2 over 4. Well, we can half top bomb, so it's a half. And you can see there that half of that's shaded. So what is half as a percentage? Well, a whole as a percentage is 100%. So a half as a percentage is 50%. And if you didn't know that, you need to just practice knowing the main percentages. A tenth is 10%, a hundredth is 1%, uh, and a quarter is 25%. Okay, the next question says what fraction is shaded? So we need to know two things. First of all, how many squares are shaded? So one, two, three. So it'd be three over the total amount of squares. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight squares. So the fraction is three over eight. For the next question, it says shade in a fifth of this shape. Well, there's 10 squares altogether and we want to shade a fifth. So we need to find a fifth of 10. In other words, what's a fifth times 10? When you times um, something by a fraction, just divide it by the bottom of the fraction. So another way of writing that is 10 divided by 5, which is 2. A different way of thinking about this question is if you cut this shape up into five equal sections, those sections, the green sections, become a fifth. So if we want to shade one fifth, we just want to shade in one of those sections. And actually, that's the amount of squares that our calculation just worked out. So it should be two squares. Now, it doesn't have to be the two squares that I've shaded. As long as you've shaded in two squares, then you've answered the question. And the last question says, um, write down the fractions there that are equivalent to a quarter. Well, a nice easy way of starting this question off is just write down things that are equivalent to a quarter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to times top and bottom of this fraction by 2. So 2 over 8. So I've times them by 2. Then I'm going to times them by 3. So it would be 3 over 12. Then I'm going to times them both by 4, and I'm, I'm just looking at this original fraction here. I'm going to times them both by 4, so it would be 4 over 16, and times them both by 5, 5 over 20. Now all those fractions are equivalent, which means the same as a quarter. So let's have a look at our list. Well, we've got 2 over 8 there, so it's that one, and we've got 5 over 20 there. So my, my answer is going to be fraction B and fraction C. With stem and leaves, the tens, and sometimes the units, but mainly the tens, are in this column, and then the units go in this bit here. So, first of all, I'm going to pick the smallest number, and it's easier to do this by doing it smallest to biggest, because the units here must be in order of size. Now the order goes, the smallest go on the left hand side and the biggest on the right hand side. However, if you're doing a stem leaf over here, the biggest go on the right hand side, sorry, the smallest go on the right hand side and the biggest go on the left hand side. Basically the smallest must be as close to the middle and the biggest must be away from the middle. Okay, so the smallest one we've got is 30, so we're going to do 30 first. And we've got the 3 already, so we're just going to put a 0 there, and that represents 30. Then the next smallest, I think, is 33, so the 3 goes there. Uh, I think the next smallest is 39, so the 9 goes there. 
Okay, and that's the 30s done. So let's move on to 40s. 41 goes there. 43 goes there. 44, 48. And the last uh, last few, so 52 and 52, well, they're the same, so they can be next to each other, and 64. So the smallest go on the left, and then you get bigger as you go to the right, and that's really important because you need to do that to get the right mar marks, or to get the right correct answer. Okay, the last thing to do is the key. Now, the key is just pick a value, any value. I always pick the one at the top left but it can be any value it doesn't even have to be a value on there and you do three line zero which i've just copied the bit i've done in the yellow means 30. now you might ask why do we need that because it's always going to be 30. well not quite because you can get ones that are four line one means 4.1 which is why these ones here aren't always going to be tens. Sometimes those will be units and you'll be writing down the decimals. So just look out for that. Now you need to have, first of all, all the numbers in the stem and leaf, secondly, them in order, and thirdly, the key. That's what the mark scheme is going to say. So the first thing to look at in this question is how many sides has the spinner got? So we've got one, two, three, four equally sized, equally spaced out sides of that spinner. So any one of those um, colors is going to be a quarter chance. So let's have a look. What letter of the property, the probability line represents the probability the spinner will land on a yellow. So there is one yellow on that spinner. And so therefore it's going to be a quarter chance. So if you have a look at how many notches this number line has, well, we don't count the first one, so we've got one, two, three, four notches. So each one of those notches is going to be a quarter. So one quarter will be at B. Which letter represents probability of landing on a red? So we have two reds there. So that's going to be two quarters. So we've got one quarter and two quarters would be at C. Now two quarters is the same as a half which is what the 0 0.5 there is, it's just a half. What letter on the property line represents the probability it will land on a blue? Well, there aren't any blues on there. So however many times you spin it, it will never land on a blue. And in probability, we mark that with a zero. So it's going to be A. And the place I'd start with this question, since we're going to be asked for the median anyway, is just to put these in order of sides and that will help us work out the mode and range. You don't have to do it, it's just it's much easier to spot. So the smallest number is 38. Uh, is there another 38? No, the next number is 39. I think there's a few 39s. Okay, the next number is 41. And I'm crossing them out as I go so I don't count them twice accidentally. 42, 43, 44. Now the mode means most. Okay, if you just remember that, mode most is pretty much the same word. So what came up the most? Well, if you have a look, there are three 39s there, and there's two 42s, two 41s. So 39 came up the most. And it's much easier to spot when they're all lined up. The range is the biggest, take away smallest. And again, this is a lot easier when they're all lined up. So it's 44, which is the biggest, take away the smallest, which is 38. Now, I know that you can do this in your head, but use your calculator anyway, why not? Um, because this is a calculator question, but we know the answer is going to be six. Okay, so the median. Now the median is the one that you've got to find the middle one, so it's the middle, when in order. And I put that in capitals because most people forget that one who get this question wrong. You have to put them in order of size first, okay? And what you do is you cross out one from both sides, then another one from both sides, then another one from both sides, then another, 
until you're left with one or two in the middle. Now, if you're left with two in the middle, then you add them together and halve it. Or find the number that's halfway between the two. Now, if they're both 41, the median will be 41. If you think about it, 41 times 2 is 82, and then halve it, it's going to be 41. Now, the mean is, a lot of people call it the mean one. You add them all together and divide it by how many? So I'm going to do this on my calculator. I'm going to do 38 plus 39 plus 39 plus 39 plus 41 plus 41 plus 42 plus 42 plus 43 plus 44. Hopefully I've got the right answer of 408. Over how many there are? Well, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So I need to divide that by 10 and I get 40.8 for the mean. Now, it, I would always double check that, so I'm going to do it again on my calculator, because when you're typing a whole load of numbers, it's always easy to make a mistake, but it's very rare to make the same mistake twice, and it's come up with 408 again, so I know it's probably right. The easiest way to order decimals is just to put yourself a few columns down the page and hopefully I'm going to try and get enough columns. I always end up with not enough so if I put some extra ones in that should suffice and just literally put the numbers in so 14.828 and make sure the point, decimal points are lined up so 8.60 is going to be like this and I'm going to put an extra zero in to make them all the same length it doesn't change the number at all so 14.86 I'm going to put zero in there 14.820 and then 14.7 now we're starting with the smallest so I'm looking for the smallest one first well, the smallest one's leaping out because if I just look at this column, there's only one number that has a zero there. All the rest of them have one. So the 8.60, and I have to put the zero because that's how it's said in the question, is definitely the smallest. So we can cross that out. That's definitely the smallest. All the other ones are tied. They're all one in that column. So we move over to the left, the next column, sorry, the next one to the right. So 4444, four, 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 they're all tied. So I keep moving along. Okay, though there's a clear loser in this one. There's a clear one that's the smallest in this one. The bottom one, 14.7. So that's definitely the next smallest. So I can cross that one out. All the other three have tied because they're all eight. So I move on to the next column. Now, looking at this, there's two twos and a six. Now that six is definitely the biggest number. So I could fill that in as the biggest number. And we've just got to work out what the smaller of these remaining two are. Well, let's move on a column. And you can see here that 14.82 is the small, smallest or smaller of the two. And so that leaves the 14.828 in that position. Now always just double check the five numbers you've listed are the same as um, in the question. That's the same, 18.60, that's the same, 14.86, that's the same, 14.82 uh, is the same, and 14.7 is the same. You sometimes lose a mark if you haven't written exactly the same number. Same goes for when there's fractions and decimals. You've got to write down the number that it showed in the question. first thing to look at with a pictogram, which this is, um, is the key. Now the key tells us what each picture represents. So if you have a look at the key here, it says each circle represents eight DVDs. Now that's the complete circle. So it says what day are the most DVDs sold, Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday? Well, or you can always just look at which has the most shapes. Now, Tuesday has two, Wednesday has one and a half, but Monday has over two, two and three quarters. 
so it's definitely going to be Monday because it's got the most circles. Now, how many DVDs were sold on Tuesday? Well, if each circle represents eight, there's eight there and there's eight there. So we just need to add the eights together, which makes 16. So 16 DVDs were sold on Tuesday. It says, how many DVDs were sold on Monday? Well, you've got the eight there and you've got the eight there. Now, we've got a bit of a problem here because it's not a complete eight. So we need to figure out how much each quarter is worth. Well, what do you times by four to get to eight? Well, two. Let's check to see if that works. So we've got two there, two there, two there, and an extra two, which is actually missing on that one, would make eight. So that's that would work perfectly. So to find out a quarter of it, we just divide it by four, which gives us two. So we've got the eight because we've got two complete circles and then we've got those three two so we've got another six so we just need to add on six to the sixteen so sixteen plus six is going to be twenty two so that's going to be twenty two okay let's have a look at the next question on Thursday twenty DVDs were sold show this information on a pictogram so Let's have a think how many circles that will be. So if I put one circle down, that's eight. Well, we've still got enough left over. If I put another full circle down, that's 16. Now, 16, let's try another one. Let's put another full circle down, and that gives us 24. So that would be too much. So we're going to have to go into those quarters. So we've got 16. How many more twos do we need? So 16... That would give us 18, and that would give us 20. So we need two whole circles, and then two quarters. So if I shade in, uh, if I draw, then shade in, two whole circles, and then we've got two quarters left over, which is just a half. Let's just check that. What's half of eight? That would be four. And what's 8 plus 8 plus 4? That gives us 20. So we know the answer is correct. So we're given a basic formula to work out how long this turkey is going to take to cook. It says that the cooking time, so we can just call that time, is the weight, which it says is a 3 kilogram turkey. And just check that the units are the same, which they are. So it's the 3 times 30 then add 90 3 times 30 is 90 and 90 plus 90 is 180 now just double check that it wants it in minutes sometimes it'll ask for it in hours well it says it wants it in minutes so 180 so we're given function machines for this question and it says, uh, what is the output when the input's 24? So the input's 24, and the first thing that's going to happen to it is it's going to divide by 2, so we're going to halve it. So that's going to make it 12. Then it says we're going to add 6. So when we add 6 to 12, we get 18. So the output is 18. Next question says, below is a different number machine. It says, when the input is 20, the output is 56. So let's follow through on the input. So the input's 20, we go take away 6, so that's going to give us 14. Now we've got to then think, right, how do I get from 14 to 56? Now, as it stands, there are multiple ways of doing this. If you do this on onmaths.com, it has a drop down box and it only lets you select one of the options. So you can add a number to 14 to get to 56, and for this question that would be full marks, that would be absolutely fine. Or you can times it by 4, and times by 4 is the one I'm going to go for. So I'm going to complete the number machine by saying times 4. Okay, so the numbers in this question seem a bit daunting, but the process is always the same with this type of question in ratios. The first thing you've got to realise is, are you given a total amount or are you given an amount of food or amount of drink? If it says in total, 
they spend that amount. So it's a total amount. So step one is to work out how many parts you have all together. So for food, it's 39. And for drink, it's four. And this will be a calculator question, so why not use the calculator even though we can do it in our head. 43 parts. So we've got 43 parts. The next um, stage of this is to work out what one part is worth. So one part is worth how much? Well, you get the amount and you divide it by the number of parts. You're splitting the amount of money between 43 parts. So 11911 divided by 43. And I get 277 pounds. So each one part is worth 277 pounds. Now let's read the question. Find how, how much money is spent on drink. Well, drink is this one here. And the order which they are in the question, food, drink, is the order which the ratios are. So food, then drink here. So there are four uh, parts. So we're just going to write drink. So for each one part's worth 277, we're just going to do four lots of that. And I might as well do it in the calculator, times by four, and that's going to be 1108, so 1108. When you're asked to do a plan or a front or side elevation, it's important to remember that the diagram you're going to be drawing must be absolutely square on. So there's not going to be any 3D lines at all. It's just going to be 2D shapes like rectangles. Sometimes you have triangles. Occasionally you might get a circle or a semicircle. So let's have a think. What does plan mean? Plan means view from the top. So what of this shape are we going to see from the top? Well, we're definitely going to see this one. But we'll also see this one as well. Now, we've got to work out what the sizes of them are going to be. Well, the top one's easy. It's just 7 centimeters by 6 centimeters. Now, I'm not going to be able to draw this accurately because I don't have a ruler. But we can almost get it right. I can get it kind of right. And if I label it, that's going to be 7 centimeters, and that should be 6 centimeters. And in your exam, just make sure you actually measure them because they are said to you in here and it does say accurately construct so you want to make sure that it's done seven centimeters and six centimeters now the difficulty is going to be the last bit well we know it's going to be six across because it's the same as this one here but what's the width going to be what's this one going to be here well if this one here is seven and this one here is nine what's left over well, there's two centimeters left over, so it's going to be two centimeters in width. Ooh. Let's use this one, right? So it's going to be two centimeters in width. So two centimeters there, and this one obviously is going to be six centimeters, the same as the right hand one. Now, this line we have in the middle, this line here, is really important because that shows that there's a join, that there's there's something happening there. So you need to construct, you need to show that, especially if there's a change in elevation, just show it with a line on the diagram. Okay, so this is quite a tricky question because it mixes fractions and ratios together, but we've got to be comfortable with that. So I'd first of all, just show the information so that I can get my head around it. So we've got Denver who as a fraction has 3 19ths of the food. And so that leaves how much? Well, we've got a calculator, so we could just do one take away three over 19 on the calculator, but we know that that's gonna be 16 over 19. So we can kind of ignore Denver now because we used Denver's amount or fraction of the food to work out Engels and Fido's combined. So that's how much food they'll get but they're sharing it in the ratio of 5 to 2. So in total, the amount of parts they have is 5 plus 2, which is 7. So there's 7 parts all together. Okay. And each part, so one part, is going to be worth, well, 
as a fraction 16 over 19 divided by 7. So 16 over 19 on the calculator divided by 7, which gives us 16 over 133. So that's the fraction of each part. Now it says, um, show uh, what is Fido's share. So we're looking for Fido's share. Now Fido gets two lots of that. So looking for Fido, he gets two lots of that fraction. So I'm going to times that by 2 on the calculator, which is 32 over 133. Now it does say show your answer as a percentage rounded to the nearest percent. So to work um, between uh, fractions and, and uh, percentages, I just need to times by 100. So what I can do is just times that by 100. I'll do it on the calculator, times by 100. And press S to D if it comes up as a fraction. And it says 24.060 blah blah blah. So to the nearest percent, um, Fido gets 24%. With two-way tables, we've got to use the totals to work out the missing numbers. So, a nice place to start is this box here. If we have a look, we've got a total of 46 people who are with brown eyes. 23 of them are female. So all we need to do is 46 and take away the 23. And that leaves 23 left over. Now, let's have a look at a nice easy one. Right, green eyes. That's a nice easy one there. We've got 48 in total um, and 27 females with green eyes. So we want to do 48, take away 27, and that leaves us with 21. Now if we have a look at this one, we have 23 females uh, with, sorry, 23 males with brown eyes, tw uh, 18 males with blue eyes, and 21 males with green eyes. And we assume that there weren't any others because they're not in the table. So we add those together and that gives us 62 in total. And let's have a look at this one maybe. So we've got 62 females all together and we've got 27 of them have green eyes and 23 of them have brown eyes. So we take those 23 and the 27 away from 62 and that leaves us with 12. And we can just check that. We can do 23 plus 12 plus 27 and it equals 62, so we know that's right. With that one sorted, we can get this one. And if there's 18 males with blue eyes and 12 females with blue eyes, that means there's going to be 30 altogether. Now this total is either the total of these ones or the total of these ones, and they should give you the same number. Don't add the blue and the green ones together. So it's only one of them. So 46 plus 30 plus 48 is 124. And let's just check that. 62 plus 62 is also 124. So don't ever write down 248 because that's not correct. So in total there are 124 people whose eye colour were checked. So inequalities, what are they? They just mean instead of x equaling something, x is greater than or smaller than something. So x can normally have lots of different values. Now, this statement here is really important. Integer just means a whole number. So we know that x can't be a half, because that's not a whole number. Now, x says here x is greater than minus 7 and is less than or equal to 3. So when it asks you to write down all the numbers that that's true for, well, let's have a think. Well, if it's less than, sorry, if it's greater than minus 7, then it can't be minus 7. It can't be equal to it. So it's going to be minus 6, minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. Now let's have a look at the other one. It says x can be less than or equal to 3. So that line there, if you look at it, that little line there, so if I do it a little bit bigger, the line that I've just drawn there says it can be 3. So we must include 3 in our answer. 
and that's how you get full marks. Now you probably will get one mark if you forget to put the three down or you put the minus seven accidentally. Right, the next one I'm just gonna write out a little bit bigger. Now the way we do this question is the same way as solving just a normal equation with an equals, but don't ever put an equals. There was an exam um, a few years ago that if you wrote an equals in it, they would give you zero marks. So the first step is to expand the brackets. So I do smiles and rainbows, but if you've got another method, that's fine. I'll put a little line there to remind me to times it. So five times three X is 15 X. And five times minus five is minus 25. Now that you could have divided both sides by five and that would have been fine. Um, next step is to get rid of this minus 25. And you must start with that. You can't get rid of the 15 first. So we're gonna add 25 to both sides to get rid of that minus 25. So we're left with 15 X on this side and 35 plus 25 will be, well, five plus 35 is 40, 40 plus 20 is 60. Now to get rid of this times 15, we need to divide both sides by 15. So that will get rid of the 15 there. And how many 15s in 60? Well, two times 15 is 30, so it'd be four. Now be really careful not to accidentally put any equal signs in your answer, and especially this bit here. So to, it's X is greater than four. Okay, so this question is a little bit more complicated than it first seems. So we've got Adrian, Ben, and Charlie, and they share some sweets in the ratio of six to three to eight. And it says that Charlie got 12 more sweets than Adrian. Well, first of all, let's have a look and see how many more parts that um, Charlie Ooh. Always cross my L's for some reason. Charlie uh, got more than Adrian. Okay, so he got eight takeaway six is two. So he got two more parts. And so let's have a look and see what one part is worth. So those two parts equate to 12 more sweets. So we do 12 divided by two, six. So each part is worth six sweets. And it says work out the total amount of sweets. So we need to work out how many parts there are in total. So we do six plus three plus eight. Now I know um, six plus eight is uh, 14 plus three is 17. So we've got 17 parts in total. Each of them is worth six sweets. So to work out the amount of sweets, we do 17 times six. Now we could do seven times six, which is 42, 10 times six, which is 60. So add the two together, it's 102. So there are 102 sweets altogether. In this question, we're asked to draw the line y equals 2x plus 3. Now, there's no x squared or x cubed, so I know it's going to be a straight line graph. Um, now, there's multiple ways of doing this. I'm going to do it using a table, and then I'm going to show you a, a few other tricks of doing it much quicker or checking that you've got it right. The first number I'm going to start with is zero, and this what I'm circling now is going to be a coordinate to plot on our graph. So the top number, the zero, is the x, so this is when x equals zero. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed that into my equation. So when x equals zero, or well y equals two times x, so two times zero plus three. Two times zero is just zero, so y equals 3. Now you don't need to do this working out for every single number, but I'm just doing it to show you how I'm getting to the y. So I'm going to try the next one without any working out. So we've got 1. And so 2 times 1 is 2, plus 3 is 5. 
Then the next coordinate, we've got x equals 2. So 2 times 2 is 4, plus 3 is 7. And the next one, we've got 3. So 2 times 3 is 6, plus 3 is 9. OK, and I always go back to the negatives, because I can kind of see a pattern with the positive numbers. So I can use that pattern to check that I'm doing this right. So 2 times minus 1, well, positive times a negative is a negative, so that's minus 2. And minus 2 plus 3, well, if I just use the number line, minus 2 plus 3. So 1, 2, 3 will be 1. And I can notice that they're going down in 2, so 9, 7, 5, 3, 1. So let's try the next one. 2 times negative 2 is minus 4. Minus 4 plus 3 is minus 1. Minus 3 times 2 is minus 6. Minus 6 plus 3 is minus 3. So those are my final two coordinates. The next step is to plot the coordinates on the graph. So my first coordinate is minus 3, minus 3. My next one's minus 2, minus 1. Then we've got minus 1, 1. Then we've got 0, 3. Then we've got 1, 5. 2, 7 and 3, 9. Now I want to join those up with a straight line. So let's do that now. And the last step is to label it. And sometimes you're asked to draw more than one line. So we should label it. There we go. Now, I can check that this is right because all of the numbers landed on the straight line. If I had one coordinate down here, I'd always check it. You're never going to have a straight line graph that goes up and then dips down and then goes back up again. Okay, so it's, a, it's an easy way to check that you've got it right. Now I said there was a quicker way of doing this. If you have a look at the graph, oh, sorry, the equation, y equals 2x plus 3, this plus 3 tells us where it's going to hit the y-axis. So I can plot that one straight away. This 2 is a gradient, so if I go across 1, it tells us how far up it's going to go. And I just do that a few times to get three coordinates, and I can draw my straight line graph from that, and I don't need to put the table. But if the question asks you to fill out the table, obviously you need to fill out the table. First thing we need to realise with this question is which transformation is it? Well, you have to go through the four transformations. The first one I think of is, it has it rotated, has it spun around? No, it hasn't. Second one, uh, is, it, is there a mirror image of it? No, they both look the same, so it's not, it's not been reflected. Has it grown or shrunk at all? No, so it's not an enlargement. So that leaves transformation. Uh, sorry, translation. <laughs> Translation. Now, translation just means we've moved it, and that's perfect because we have just moved A for, to B. Now, the second thing to realize is we are starting at shape A and we're going to shape B. Now, with translations, to describe them, pick the same point on both shapes. I always pick the top left if it's available. Then, what we want to do is work out how far left or right I have to go from A to get in line with B. And I do this with jumps. And the reason we do this with jumps is I never get the wrong answer when I do jumps. So one, two. I need to go two left. So two left. And let's have a thing. How much up do we have to go? So one jump, two, three, four. So four up. Now the way of showing translations is by using vectors. And it sounds fancy, but it's just putting this information here between a bracket. The number at the top of the bracket is how far right it's gone, and the number at the bottom is how far up it's gone. Well, let's do the number at the bottom first. So translation by, and there's different words you could use there, and at the number at the bottom where it's gone four up. So it's just a four there. Now, here's a problem. This is how far right it's gone, but it's gone two left. Well, we just simply put minus two right. Now, be careful, don't ever put a fraction line between the minus two and four. It's not a fraction, okay? So don't ever put the fraction line in. 
Okay, so we've got a scatter graph question, and the first question asks us just to plot the information from the table into the scatter graph. So we've got ice cream sales at the top and temperature at the bottom, which is not kind of the same way around as on the graph, so we've just got to be careful. So the ice cream sales are 46, which is here on the scale, and the temperature is 31, which is here on the scale. And just check that you're you're looking at the scale correctly so we're looking about let's have a look about here okay next one ice cream sales 40 which is here on the scale and uh, temperature 34 which is here so we just got to be careful and it's about there so those are the two plots that we want to take Next question says, on another day, um, ha another day had an average temperature of 45 degrees. Use the scatter graph to estimate the sales of the day. Now, you need to get used to just drawing a line of best fit to any scatter graph that you come across. You will have to do it. Okay, so just do it. Just even if it doesn't ask you to, just draw a line of best fit. Now, a line of best fit is just a line that follows all the data like that. You should have roughly the same amount of data top and bottom, but it doesn't matter if it's not perfect, okay? So, let's have a look. So we've got average temperature of 45 degrees. So we're going to draw a line up from 45 degrees, which is about there. And we're going to draw... Oh, the line didn't come up. So let's draw that line there. It's refusing to come up for some reason. Uh, let's try another one. There we go. Let's try another line. Uh, okay, let's do it the old fashioned way. Okay. And then we draw a line across from where it's the line of best fit. Now, to me, that looks like about 55. But if you had the same question and you came up with a different answer of 54 or 58, it still can be correct because you might have drawn a slightly different line of best fit. Okay, so don't worry if you sit and uh, sit down next to someone, do the same question and get a slightly different answer. Just draw the lines, straight lines, unlike mine, onto your diagram to show the examiner that you um, worked it out. So we've got 55 sales we're predicting. Now, what do we notice about this? Well, look at where all the data is. All the data is here, and yet we're estimating outside the range of the data. Okay, it's called extrapolation, where you do that. So the problem with that, if you imagine we do a graph of height against age, so we have age at the bottom and height up the side, then when you're very young, you grow quite quickly. If someone extrapolated your data and said, oh, okay, well, that growth is going to continue. When you're 80 years old, you're going to be 20 foot high. Well, that doesn't make much sense. It's because we're quite confident with down here because we've got data for that, but we're not very confident with this bit here. We don't know whether the trend continues. Now, with ice cream sales, if it's ridiculously hot, no one's going to leave their house. They're all going to be sitting inside with their air conditioning or sitting in their car with their air conditioning. So we know it probably won't continue. So if you just say that the, um, the estimate is outside the range of the data and if you want to really impress the examiner then you can use the word extrapolated it's been extrapolated these questions are just based on a few rules of indices the first rule says that if you've got two powers with the same base which these two do because they're both a you add the powers now if you think about it, a squared is a times a, a to the power of 6 is a times a times a times a times a times a. So in total we're timesing a by itself 8 times. So it's eight, a to the power of 8. The next rule says if you've got a power inside the bracket and outside the bracket, you times them together. So it's m to the power of 3 times 6, which is m to the power of 18. 
Now this last one's a little bit more complicated and I'm going to write it out so I've got a bit of a larger one to play with. Okay, first thing I focus on is the number. Now 55 over 11. So I know that 55 divided by 11 is going to be 5. 55 divided by 11, that's all we've got to do. And the reason we can do that is there's only one term at the top and one term at the bottom. A term is defined by you know whether there's a plus or a minus, and there's no pluses or minus here. Okay, so the next one, we've got the R's that we want to divide. So we've got R at the top and an R at the bottom. Now this R at the top is technically R to the power of 1. Now when we do R to the power of 1 divided by R to the power of, power of 8, which I'm going to write out down here so I can show you, you take away the powers. So when you times them, you add the powers. When you divide, you take away the powers. So that's R to the power of minus 7. Okay, now we're left with the S's. And it's the same thing with the S's. This time we're doing s to the power of 15 divided by s to the power of 8. So it's going to be s to the power of 15 take away 8, which is 7. So my answer would be 5, r to the power of minus 7, s to the power of 7. The triangle we need to remember for this question is density equals mass over volume. Now you could have kind of worked it out with the question because it says grams, which is mass, per centimetres cubed, which is volume. So per means over, so it would be mass over volume. So we need to work out the mass. Well, at the moment we have the density, so we've got that, but we haven't got the volume. So the first thing I need to do is work out the volume of the prism. So to work out the volume of any prism, it's the um, cross-section area. times the length and some people call the length something else but the length is basically how 3d the prism is so the length is this one here and the cross-sectional area is the area of this triangle here so it's the area of the triangle we've got the base which is 4 and the height which is 9 so it's half times base times height and then we go times it by the length which is 10 so what have we got? The base which is 4, so it's half times 4 times the height which is 9 times 10. Now um, the reason I know the height is 9 is that it hits the base at right angles and that's really important. The base and the height must be at right angles and don't forget to halve it. Now what I can do here is something quite sneaky. What I can do is I do half times the 4 to get 2 and that saves me timesing some big numbers together just to halve it. So 2 times 9, which is 18, times 10, which is going to be 180. Or you can just type it into the calculator if it's on the calculator paper. OK, so that is in centimetres um, cubed, because every uh, unit is in centimetres. And make sure you check that. So the volume is 180. So to work out the mass, if I cover up the mass in the diagram, so I cover that up, it says to work out the mass I do density times volume. So it gives me the density in the question which is 5.5 and I'm going to times that by 180. So if I have a calculator I can just type that in, otherwise I could do um, 5 times 180, well I can do 10 times 180 which is 1800, then halve it which is going to be 900 and then half times 180, which is 90. So that's 990. So the answer is 990 grams. Okay, so this question's about a adult, or an adult, and two children. So we've got David Smith and two children. So there's one adult and two children. But the prices shown are not quite right because there's a discount. And there's a fifth off adult price and 30% off the child price. So let's work out the adult price first. 
So a fifth of, well first of all let's work out a fifth of £70. So to work out a fifth you can just divide 70 by 5. Now I know that 10 fives are 50 and 4 fives are 20, so that's going to be 14. So that's going to be £14 he gets off, so therefore the price will be um, the £70 take away the £14. Uh, so 70 take away 10 is 60, take away 4 is 56. So he's going to pay £56 himself. Let's do the uh, child price. Okay, so it's 30% off the child price. So we want to do 30% of £37. Okay, let's do the equals down here to give us some room. Well, I know that 10% is going to be £3.70. And then I need to times that by 3. Okay, so I could just times it by 3. Um, let's, let's have a think. I could do 370. I could do it in pence and then just times that by 3. So 370. Um, and then I can just do times 3. So I can do a little grid. And if this is on the calculator, then obviously you just type it into the calculator. And obviously that's going to be 0, so we don't need that one. So that's 900. That's 21 with a 0. So 900 plus 21, 210 even. So 0, 1, and then 11. So that's going to be £11.10. And so we want to work out the price. So it's going to be uh, £37, take away £11.10. So if you take away 10 is 27, take away 1 is 26, take away 10 is £25.90. Now that's for one child, so that's one child. So if I want two children, I want to do £25.90 times 2. Now I know 25 times 2 is 50, 90 times 2 is £1.80, so that's going to be £51.80. OK, I'll move down a bit and let's do the total. So the total is going to be the adult price, which is this one here, plus the two children price, which is that one there. So I want to do 56 plus £51.80. And again, if you've got a calculator, you can just type it in. But let's do the column method. £1.80. And then people like putting the zeros in. So that's going to be 0, 8, 7, 10. So that's going to be £107.80. So it's £107.80. Finished. I say you'll need a calculator for this question. The um, different calculators do things slightly different, but the, by far the most common calculator, and if you haven't got one, I would recommend them, are the Casio calculators. Mine has a shiny solar panel on the top, but you don't need that. The average uh, battery life lasts way longer than you'll ever need the calculator. So the first button I would press, and there's different ways of doing this question, is the button to get the fraction which on the Casios looks like this and that will make a fraction appear on your calculator now some of the older ones the fraction looks a bit weird it involves like a symbol like this and actually on the new ones it can but you need to change the settings if it does that it should open up uh, it should look something like this like a box and then another box and there should be a cursor blinking in this box OK, so we want to fill in this top box first, since it's already flashing. So 76.8 plus 81.9. OK, and so to shift downwards on the Casio calculators, there's a sort of cursor, but, uh, like a cursor stick, a direction button thing. It's the big blue button beneath the screen on most of the calculators. And you just push the down to go to the denominator of the uh, fraction. And then we need to fill in this bit here, so 
9 and then to get the squared button it's on like that so you just press that and it looks exactly as it does in the question on the screen so you know you've got it right so you press the equals and my one comes up with 4396.121884 now it might be tempting to try and round that but it says it wants all the figures so just put them all in now if you if your calculator is uh, set to a mode which it's going to show even more numbers then normally six uh, six digits after the decimal point is more than enough they won't require you to go to 100 or 200 decimal places uh, on this question that's actually an exact amount okay so write down it correct to two significant figures now to do two significant figures we start counting at the start of the number so I'm going to do a red line where you need to start counting and you just count one two numbers so the blue line is where I've stopped counting now all of these numbers here are going to be reset to zero they're going to go away well mm, not quite let's come to that later now this number here the nine is what we call a decider number now that not number is going to go that nine is gone okay but before it goes we need to see whether that is five or more or four or less if it's five or more it pushes that three up to a four so the answer will be four four and then you would think oh okay that's it that's it rounded and you'd write that in your answer column but when I said they disappear they don't quite disappear all the numbers ab above the green line that I've just drawn reset to zero they turn to zero now if you think about it if uh, I don't know I don't know what I'm what would have a decimal place but if you if you have a number 4396.121884 written down and someone says can you tell me roughly how much that is then if you say the answer of 44 that's that's not roughly 44 it's nowhere near 44 so the 9 and the 6 will turn to 0 and actually the other numbers do too but these numbers here are not changing the number at all. These two zeros here will make that 4,400 instead of just 44. The other numbers after decimal point, just we might as well get rid of them. So the answer is 4,400, okay, because we don't need to show these numbers. Now, the reason students make this mistake is they're so used to decimal places. Now, decimal places, you always remove them because they're always after the decimal point. But with significant figures, they need to turn to zeros. So this question looks quite complicated at first, but actually there are two very simple-ish ways of doing it. We've got two decagons, and so that means they are ten-sided. And you can just count the sides if you want, but you know, if it says it's a decagon, I trust it, it's a decagon. Now what we can do is we could work out the interior angles of the decagons. Well, they'll be the same, so I can just work out one and then double it. And then take that away from 360 to work out A. And that's absolutely fine, that'll get you the right answer. A quicker way, maybe and especially on the non-calculator paper, but it works on both papers, is to draw a line up here and realise that you've got two exterior angles there. And the beauty of exterior angles for polygons is they always add up to 360. So to work out the exterior angle, always write down what you're working out, all you need to do is 360 divided by the number of sides the regular polygon has. And they have to be regular, otherwise you can't just divide them because we're assuming they're the same. So that's 36. So if that one's 36 degrees there, and that one's 36 degrees there, then all you need to do is 36 times 2. Well, 6 times 2 is 12, 30 times 2 is 6, so that's going to be 72. So let's show the examiner that. 36 times 2 equals 72 degrees.
So this question says there's a tennis tournament uh, being played where each player plays each other once. And there's multiple ways of doing this. One of the ways is listing out all the different combinations. But this question only asks for how many tennis matches are being played. So you don't need to list them out. And sometimes you will need to list them out. This one you don't. So let's start off with a liar. A liar has four people that they're going to play against. William. So, William, Paul, Samantha, and Christine. William, well, we've already counted Elias' match with William, so William only has three left that he can play. Then Paul has already, we've already counted his match with the other two, so he's only going to play Samantha and Christine, other than his matches we've already counted. Samantha, well, Samantha's only got Christine left to play, after we uh, counted all the other matches. And Christine, well, Christine's matches have already been counted so far. So, we've got the four matches Elias going to play, the three matches that William's going to play, not counting the one we've already counted from Elia, plus the two Paul's going to play, plus the other one that Samantha's going to play. So, four plus three is seven, plus 2 is 9, plus 1 is 10. So in total, there are 10 different matches going to be played. OK, for Venn diagrams, it's really important to understand the notation. This symbol here means union. It just means or. It means it can be in A, or it can be in B, or it can be in both. So it's any number inside either circle. So I could have 9, 5, 3, 7, 18 or 2. Let's go for 9. But the other 5 would be correct. This symbol here, I always view it as an AND. I always put a little line there to say A for AND. And it means it needs to be in A and B. It can't just be an A, it can't just be in B, it needs to be in both. And there's two numbers that uh, fit that bill, 3 and 7. So I could write 3 or I could write 7. Now this little symbol here, okay, and it's an A with a dash. That dash there means not. So we're looking for numbers that aren't in A and are in B. Well, let's have a look at where not A is. Well, it's anywhere around here. Anywhere around here is not in A. And let's have a look at where B is. So B is anywhere here. So the numbers that overlap both of those are the 18 and the 2. So it's 18 and 2. So there are two numbers that fit that bill. So that will go at the top of our fraction. And there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in total. Now I can simplify that a little bit to make it a quarter. And so my answer to that will be 1 over 4, or a quarter. Whenever we see a 3D shape in a question, you've got to ask yourself, is the question asking for a volume or a surface area? And that should be the first question that goes into your mind. Yes, it might be asking for something else, but those are the main two. We're looking at this, we're filling the swimming pool with water. So it's going to be a volume question. Now, way of approaching this is figure out what the shape is. Well, the shape is um, a um, trapezium-based prism. So we've got to first of all work out what the area of the trapezium is. So I'm going to draw the trapezium out first. And that height is going to be 2.7 that side, 5.3 that side, and 25 across. And I'll leave off meters because I know they're all in meters. But do check they are all in meters when you do this. So we've got to first of all work out the area. Now the area of a trapezium is half a plus B H. Now A and B are always the two parallel sides and then the height is the one that connects them at right angles. So the height is going to be 25 there. 
and all you're doing is working out the average of the two um, uh, bases, the 2.7 and the 5.3. We're times that by 25. Okay, so we'll crack our calculator out. 2.7. Some of you will probably see this straight away. So the first bit comes out as 4, because halfway between 2.7 and 5.3 is 4. And then times 25 is going to be 100. So the area is 100 meters squared. Now, for a prism, so volume, all you need to do is work out the area of the cross section, which is this bit here, the bit we just worked out, and then times it by how 3D it is. I think they call that the length officially, 15 meters. So the volume is going to be 100 meters squared times 15, which is going to be 1,500 meters cubed. So that's what the volume is, and it says the machine transports the water at a rate of 20 meters cubed per minute. So in one minute it's going to be 20, in two minutes 40. The other way of working this out, or the other way of thinking about this, is how many 20s are there in 1500? So we can say time equals, so this is how much it's got to, fi uh, got to fill and this is how much it does per minute. So on the calculator, 1,500 divided by 20, which equals 75 minutes. So it's going to take 75 minutes to fill the pool. OK, so for this question, we need to work out the length of the arc, which is around here. And then we need to work out what this and this are. So we're going to do arc first. I'm going to show the examiner that I'm doing the arc first. Now, the uh, distance of the arc is the um, total circumference of the circle times by the fraction of the circle we've got. So you want to work out what the fraction is of the circle and times it by the circumference of the circle. So to work out the fraction of the circle we've got, well, we've got 146 degrees, and there are 360 degrees in total in a circle. The formula for the circumference of the total circle is pi d, or 2 pi r. Well, here we've got a radius, because it's halfway across the circle. If you imagine the whole circle looks something like that, then the 37 is the radius. So we need to first of all double the radius to get the diameter, and then so we're going to do pi times 74, which is twice 37. Okay, so we type that all into our calculator, so press the fraction button, 146 over 360 times pi times 74. And it gives me in terms of pi, I don't need it in terms of pi, I just need it as a decimal. So 94.2826, blah, blah, blah. Now that's for the arc length, but we also want to know what this distance here is. Well, we've already got that one. And what this distance here is. Well, they are both radiuses, or radii we call it. So that's also going to be 37 metres. So to work out the perimeter... I'm just going to get that 94.2826 blah 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 and I'm going to keep it in my calculator I'm going to add 37 and add another lot of 37 so add 37 add 37 and that gives me 168.2826 blah 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 it wants it to two decimal places so line goes down here and we've got 168 0.28. Now just be careful that you add on the extra bits. When it asks you for a perimeter, just make sure you've gone the total distance around the shape. Put a dot and just draw with your finger around the shape to make sure you've got all the distances. So the first thing we're going to do is fill out the table. 
and so when it's x cubed plus 10 I'm just going to cube the x and then add 10 so 0 cubed plus 10 is just 10 and I always start off with 0 because it's normally the easiest then I go for the positive numbers so 1 cubed is 1 plus 10 is 11 2 cubed so 2 times 2 times 2 is 8 plus 10 is 18 and 3 cubed, 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27, so that's going to be 37. Now, minus 1 cubed. Now, some people think that minus 1 cubed will be a positive number, but it's minus 1 times minus 1, which is 1, times minus 1, which actually is going to be minus 1. So it's minus 1 plus 10, which is going to be 9. And then minus 2 cubed. Um, is going to be minus 8 plus 10, which is going to be 2. So when we plot this on the graph, uh, minus 2 is going to be at 2, uh, minus 1 is at 9, um, 0, 10, 1 is 11, uh, 2 is 18, and 3 is 37. Okay, and you want to try and uh, join these up with a curve. It looks like an S the cubic, like that. Sometimes you get a dip like that. On this one, you don't. So let's try and join these up with one straight line. I've already broken that rule. Oh, it's not very easy on this. And I would say that that's good enough. There's a little bit of wiggle there, but I think I can get away with that. Um, the important thing is it goes through all the points and it's just one straight line. You don't do any feathering. And feathering is where you go like this. You know, I've exaggerated it slightly, but you just want to draw one line. Okay. So it says use a graph to find out the value of x when y is 15. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line across where y is 15. So y is 15 here, and the solution is going to be where the two lines hit. Now I think that's 1.7, so I'm going to go for 1.7, because it asks for one decimal place. Now normally with drawing questions, because people draw slightly different, normally there's a little bit of leeway in it. As long as you've used your graph and you've shown the examiner that you've used that line there. Okay, so this question, it um, looks like a standard bearings question. But something you might notice is there's no angles in it. So if there's no angles in it, we need something else. And that something else is going to involve the right angle triangle here. So we can see there's a right angle triangle here. And we know that when we've got right angle triangle, we've got two sides, we can find an angle with trigonometry. I'm going to call this angle x. Now to find x, we need trigonometry. And to do trigonometry, we need to label the sides. So we've got the opposite here, which is opposite the angle we want. We've got the adjacent here. And we've got the hypotenuse here. Well, the hypotenuse is no interest. We're not looking for it and um, we're not given it. So it's O and A. So writing Socrates or Katoa. Well, we don't have, we're not interested in the H, so it's not going to be So, and it's not going to be Ka, so it's going to be Toa. So Toa stands for tan x equals opposite over adjacent and the opposite is 47 and the adjacent is 72 now we want to work out what x is so to do that we want to inverse tan both sides okay let's just scroll down okay so on the calculator you want to click shift or the equivalent in your calculator and then tan and then you press the fraction button 47 and go down 72 
Just don't forget to close the brackets. Every time you click tan or inverse tan, it opens the set brackets. Just make sure you shut them. Let's press equals. And that equals 33.1356, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's have a look. So X is 33, but we still haven't got a um, bearing. What we can do is work out what this one is, and I'm going to call that Y. So to work out what Y is, it's going to be 33.1. Well, we're looking for a nearest whole number. So let's call that 33. And then we're going to add the right angle here. Now, the reason I know this is a right angle here is because it says that he heads west and then south. So I know that both the angle here and the angle here are going to be right angles because the angle between all four, north, east, south and west, all four directions are going to be right angles. So I'm going to add 90. And you can do this in the calculator or you can do it in your head. I'm going to do it on the calculator. 123. Okay, now bearings, something that we've got to remember, are always from north going clockwise. So it's always going to be like that. It's going to be that angle there. So to do that, we're going to do 360. And we're going to take away the 123 because that's the, what we don't want. So on a calculator, 360, take away 123, and that's 237. So the answer is 237 degrees. Well, I hope you found that video useful. Um, if you liked the video, please click like. If you um, really liked the video, please click subscribe. Please check out our website on maths.com for some last minute revision. We've got all of the topics on there called Topic Busters. We've got quick multiple choice ones which we have video explanations for instantly, uh, called Minute Marks. And we've got a whole load of other stuff on the website. Thank you very much for watching.